I want you to take out your Bibles if you have them, Matthew chapter 4. We're going to go over a couple of things. We've been talking, uh, this is our second week of Shark Week, which by the way on Discovery Channel starts August 12th, the 25th anniversary. There's probably nothing better on TV. One of the most watched programs uh, out of all network TV and all the cable TV, especially the 25th anniversary. And what we've been talking about is Shark Week on how, what does Shark Week mean for us? What does it mean for our life? And we discovered some things last week out of scripture on what it means and the process that these oceanographers and these scientists go through um, to lure and to grab uh, these sharks, different kinds, different species, lemon, hammerhead, nurse sharks, but especially the great white. And the process that they go through to lure them out of where they are so that they can uh, manipulate them, so that they can study them, their behaviors and how they react in certain situations. And what we talked about is, isn't that how our spiritual enemy does to us. He lures us out and he brings us out from where we are or where we want to go or what we're created to be and what we're created to do. Here we go. And he lures us away from those things. And he pulls us away from those things. So I want to continue this week on what a shark week mean to us. And last week we said this, that temptation is a process. Temptation just isn't a single event. Temptation is a process, and what we talked about in this process was the scriptures tell us that by our own evil desires, in James chapter 1, that by our own evil desires, not desire, evil desires, that we're lured away and enticed and pulled away from. That it's a process that happens in our lives that sometimes is blatant, but sometimes is so subtle. It just doesn't happen. It was this process of pulling away and enticing little by little. And then before you know it, we never looked past what we said last week. We never looked past the beauty of the bait to see the hook. And it was this process that happened. And when our desires, our evil desires, got together with our will, when desire said to will, hey, I want this, I want to do this, I want to be like this, I want that, they got together. And when they got together, what they created was sin. And we covered that last week, and we said temptation is a process, and we said legitimate desire being met in an illegitimate way. The things, the godly things that God puts in our hearts to desire for companionship, for relationship, for connection. There's nothing wrong with that desire. It's only when it's used in an illegitimate way to meet that desire. I want us to get that because that's the basis, that is the base. that's Shark Week. That's Shark Week. Remember last week we looked at everybody and we're gonna do it again today because it's corny, it's ridiculous, it's silly, but it works. Look to someone you don't know because that'll create a connection, trust me. Look to someone you don't know and go, you're a shark. Say it. Say, you're a shark. You're a shark. Some of us might know someone in the room that are actual sharks, if you know what I mean. Listen. Legitimate desire being met in an illegitimate, there is nothing wrong because God puts, it says in Proverbs, God puts the eternity, God puts eternity in the heart and the soul of man. Eternity, that word used, is desires. He puts desires. It's not desire. It's not godly desire that's wrong. It's when we seek to meet that desire in an illegitimate way. Oh, there's temptation. I mean, Matthew chapter 4, if you have it. Page 719 in your Bibles, on the Bible in front of you. I want you to put your eyes on this. Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist starts his ministry with an act of humility. Right after that, the scripture tells us, right into the desert. I mean, because the first temptation of Jesus is that the enemy comes to him and he says, hey, 40 days of fasting, good for you. That's great. You're hungry, aren't you? I mean, hungry, 40 days. Woo. Salt and vinegar chips and a Cuban sandwich won't quench that. I mean, 40 days, it takes a little bit more. It takes the potato salad. I mean, 40 days, and he tempts him with a fleshly, listen, with a fleshly desire. But, but the desire to eat isn't wrong, is it? 
So God created us. The desire for nourishment, the desire to eat is not wrong. There are so many things we can learn from these three temptations. But I want us to get this thing. Because until you get what I'm about to explain and what God is going to show us, everything else won't make sense. Uh, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, our author here, Matthew, says he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If you, know, if you say who everybody says that you're going to be and the enemy knows Scripture, what I love, little side note, sidebar, we'll deal with this later. We'll deal with this later. Any time temptation comes to you, it's always going to make it look like life is easier. If you would just do that, life would be much easier. But what the Scripture tells us is first we have to know who we are in Christ. First, we have to know who we are in Christ because when we know who we are in Christ, when somebody gives us the counterfeit, when somebody tells us we can be something else other than who God created us to be, that's where temptation wins. I mean, because after all, he does question who he is. He does question his identity right off the bat. If you are the son of God, just side note. Okay, next. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And I want us to get this. What Jesus uses is scripture to fight temptation. But watch what he does. What he does is he actually quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. Further, further telling us that it's the entire Bible that we listen to. It's the entire, from the beginning to the end. It all connects. Jesus, by being tempted after 40 days and 40 nights, being tempted with a fleshly desire to eat, there's nothing wrong with that. But temptation happens when, when we take what God has given us as good desires and try to fill those in illegitimate ways. He says, you're hungry. Then turn these stones, because I know you're hungry. Turn these stones into bread. And Jesus goes, no. Man shall not live by bread alone, but out of every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. Now here we go. He humbled you. God speaking through the prophet. Listen, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known. See, I'm going to provide for you in ways that you're not going to recognize or understand. If you read the scriptures, the Israelites, when God provided the manna, the first thing they didn't do was go, yes, food, this is awesome. Food, nourishment. We're starving out here. All right. No, what they said was, what's that? What's that? What's that? Because God's showing up in ways that I don't understand or I'm not used to. Because God's not going to be put in a box. He's not going to be put in a box. He's not going to be confined to your definition of what he should do, when he should do it, and who he should use. So he immediately takes the temptation and brings it all the way back to the beginning because the enemy tempts in the same ways with every man. He says, no, you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word out of the mouth that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He takes him back to Deuteronomy because even then, God the Father is trying to teach the Israelites, you cannot be nourished to fulfillment. Here we go. You cannot be nourished to fulfillment with the things that you produce out of your own hands. So I'm going to give you just enough to eat for one day so that you lean into, so that you lean into a relationship with me, so that you lean into that I'm your provider, not you, that you lean into a habit and a discipline of believing that everything you have comes from me and that I am good and that I give you things. That you lean into and not be duped or tempted when the chum hits the water to be tempted to think that God doesn't love you and God doesn't provide so you have to take matters into your own hands by yourself. Jesus takes the tempter, our enemy, all the way back to the beginning. Because it's the same principle. 
It's the same exact principle in a temptation. Funny, but the prophet Isaiah says the same thing to the people. Why spend money on what is not bread? Bread. (laughs) Nourishment. Jesus takes us back to Deuteronomy. God providing nourishment just for a day so that you would have faith and lean into a relationship, nourishment. The prophet Isaiah says the same thing. It's a theme all the way through. That the things that you produce with your own hands, your own minds, will not satisfy. You cannot live on bread alone, but only out of every, he just didn't say, word. Every word, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Uh, Isaiah says, why spend money on what is not bread? Bread known as nourishment. Bread is nourishment. But why do you spend money on like bread like that? It's right here, this is scripture. Why do you spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? What is labor? The things you do with your hands and your minds. So we got to get this principle of the temptation. And I want us to walk away with one thing knowing this morning. One thing out of the temptation. One thing on what it's like to have waters chummed for you because you're a shark. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me. And eat what is good. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. Listen. Listen to me. And eat what is good. Give ear and come to me. Hear me, not that your heart, not that your mind, that your soul. That your soul, your inner being, the thing where you're defined the thing that, that makes up your chemistry, your soul. Your soul. And the enemy takes Jesus and he says, hey, you're hungry, right? A fleshly desire. You're hungry, right? Turn these stones. Turn these stones into bread. A legitimate desire used in an illegitimate way. Temptation. Because for Jesus to turn the stones into bread to fulfill just himself would have been selfish. And your Savior, and my Savior, and your God, and my God is not selfish. And he says, turn him into stone, turn him into bread. Turn him into bread. See, the bigger picture, the bigger picture for Shark Week is that's us looking for nourishment in places that are illegitimate. Looking for nourishment in places that are illegitimate. Here's, this is what it plays, this is how it plays out in in everyday life. He or she dates a round of people. Men and women, the men are dating women to fulfill this desire for connection to fill this desire for love. A legitimate desire, but because it's so insatiable and because they're malnourished in the area of love and connection, we compromise and they compromise in their dating and their romantic life, their moral fiber and what God has called them to be and what he has called them to do and the enemy chums the waters and lures them out to meet a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. I mean, for some of us, we look at temptation and we see, we think right away, drugs and sex and and, and fornication and and adultery, absolutely. But, But what about being tempted every day to be so driven to achieve so much, to achieve status, so much that what suffers is loving relationships with friends, spouses, 
and children and family. You're being tempted. And the reality is, the reality is, because this is how it plays out, the temptation plays out in life, finding nourishment in ways and in places that will not provide nourishment. And so much so, the desire to achieve, not wrong. The desire to accomplish, not wrong. But the temptation, the chum in the water, is to make that the priority and everything falls to the wayside. The desire for connection and love and unconditional love, not wrong, God-given but used in an illegitimate way, compromising our moral fiber and our conduct. A legitimate desire used in an illegitimate way. And that's how temptation works. I mean, in a marriage, in a marriage, the idea for security, the idea to never be left alone, the desire to have those things, God-given but used in an illegitimate way that when we don't get what we feel like we deserve or we need that nourishment, we begin to look outside of what God has put together. A legitimate desire used in an illegitimate way. That's the first temptation. That's the, the desire. I am starving here. It's been 40 days and 40 nights. You bet I'd love a piece of bread. You bet I would love to eat. And what Jesus gives us is an example. Don't take that desire and use it in an illegitimate way. Because that's the chum in the water tempting you. And it'll lure you away from what you're called to be and who he made you to be. And what Jesus says is no. Because those desires first... And I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. Listen to me. If you're looking, I don't care, in a dating relationship, a marriage, if you're looking to be satisfied, that was scripture, by the things that are produced by your own intellect and your own hands, you are on a vicious cycle because you were created to worship. You were created for connection with a holy God named Jesus. And that's the temptation that all of us face every single day. Whether it's climbing the corporate ladder and shunning and putting past the the family and not having our priorities right. Whatever it may be, that insatiable nourishment that we need, like fasting after 40 days and 40 nights, but looking for it in an illegitimate way. And Jesus says, no, man shall not live by bread alone. Bread alone, those things aren't wrong but those things aren't going to fill and satisfy. But on every word, not word, not the word of God, on every word. That's why we have such a disdain for people who use scripture out of context. That's why we look at other people when they take things and they don't read the entire Bible and we look at it. It's because on every word, because every word connects, that's what Jesus did. Oh yeah, you're tempting me? Well, let me just show you something that you've been doing to people over and over since the garden. Isn't that what happened with Eve? When Eve, Genesis chapter 3, verse 2, when Eve saw the fruit and saw that it was good. Good for what? For eating. Nourishment. Had the whole garden to eat from. Had the whole garden to eat from. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. We're looking for things and at people and at companies and at positions and at paychecks and titles to fill this nourishment 
reason why people date so many people and get naked so many times is because they don't value themselves, because they don't understand that's not you, that's not who I created you to be, that's what God says to them. No, you're precious and you're valuable just the way you are, and you don't need earthly man to tell you that. And that's what happens. The reason why we compromise who God created every single person in this room to be, the reason why we compromise it is because we're looking at stones, trying to turn them into bread, and God says, stop it. Come to me. Hear me. Come to me, the scripture said. Come to me, the scripture said. Will you just listen? Listen, the scripture said. Come to me. Because there's just going to be this cycle you're going to pass a rock and wish it was bread. You're going to pass a rock and wish it was bread. And we're getting nourishment. That's the principle of the first temptation. That we seek nourishment in places that will never, ever satisfy. We seek nourishment in places that we think are going to fill us up. And then we think those things are wrong. No, they're only wrong when they become first. They're only wrong when they can become first. And when they become first. Now seek me. Seek me. Simple exercise for me. Um, I love shopping. I don't know why. It's part of my uh, girl part. Part of being a girl. I love shopping. Um, and it was so much so, and it's just like little things. They don't have to be expensive. They don't have to be little things, but this is what the therapy does. So I would go, and I just love it. Like, like buy little trinkets for the house. Uh, sometimes you buy clothes. I like clothes. A lot of times you buy clothes. But I mean, but you'd buy little things for the house, little things. I love a garden. I love our garden. I love the yard. I, love, I just like doing that, man. It feels good. What is that feeding? What's that hunger that that's feeding? And you only know there's desire to make your home a, a wonderful place, a desire to make your home welcoming. Nothing wrong with that. But when we didn't have the money to go do those things, I found myself not being as fulfilled. Stones to bread. And I love doing that. But that's not going to fill me. I had to understand that I'm still as valuable, I'm still a provider. I still love my home. Whether I can plant seasonal begonias or vincas. See, that's when you know. That's when you take the inventory. Desire to do that? No. But, but when we couldn't afford it, I found myself being down and found myself getting frustrated and depressed and realized, oh, so I was using that to fill something else up inside of me. To fill that space, that nourishment, that lat hunger inside of me. And it wasn't until it was taken away that I realized how big of a part it played of my life. Huh. Come to me, he says. While the worship team plays, our prayer team is going to be lined up against uh, the walls and in the back, and we're going to open up the front here for people who, uh, who would like to pray and kneel reason why we do that is because the Bible actually talks about separating yourself from the congregation and separating yourself from other people to come and seek the Lord and to pray. The Bible also talks about pray for one another, bear one each, other, each other's burdens in the book of Ephesians. That's why our prayer team is here. And while the worship team plays, I want you to ask one thing, Lord, and you ask, you, what, what am I being tempted with that's pulling me away? from who you want me to be. Who, 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 am I being, who am I being tempted with? What am I being tempted with? To pull me away. Lord, that's what it is. I identify it. Here's the prayer. God, have mercy on me. God, have mercy on me. I mean, because we talk about, we talk about, there is no temptations, 1 Corinthians 13, that God has not given a way out and for us to conquer. Simple prayer. Identify what's pulling you away, that's luring you, that's enticing you to be something you're not. Whether it's the corporate lie to climb, whether, whether it's being a workaholic, whatever those things are, 
whether it's another person, whether it's a thing, whether it's shopping for seasonal plants. <laughs> what is that that's pulling and enticing you away from who God called? Because that's the temptation, a legitimate desire given by God to be used in a legitimate way. And the scripture says, come to me. Come, just come. God, have mercy on me. Help me. As the prayer team, as the worship team plays and the prayer team comes, spend time talking to your father and carving out time for him to talk to you.